Murder at the Mosh Pit by Thomas Miller Chapter 1 Eight a Night to Remember Devin Macabre had always been a name to be reckoned with in the punk rock scene. Known for his wild performances and chaotic energy, his band, Slashers on Stage, had gained a cult following worldwide. But on that fateful night in Cullingsville, Indiana, Devin's concert would turn from legendary to infamous in the most horrifying way possible. Martha and Ken, a young couple deeply in love, were ecstatic to see Devin perform. They had been following Slashers on stage for years and considered themselves the band's biggest fans. Little did they know, this would be their final concert, a night that would end in unspeakable horror. The atmosphere at the park was electric. Fans screamed and pushed against each other, forming a sea of black leather, spiked hair and tattoos. As Devon took the stage, the crowd erupted in a frenzy of cheers. The band launched into their opening song, a high-energy anthem that sent the audience into a wild mosh pit. Devon, with his signature green mohawk and black eyeliner, held the crowd in the palm of his hand. His voice was raw, his guitar riffs savage, but beneath his charismatic exterior, something dark had taken hold of him. His eyes, usually filled with mischief, now gleamed with a dangerous intensity. Midway through the set, Devin grabbed a chainsaw guitar, a grotesque instrument custom made for shock value. As the music reached a fever pitch, he swung it in a wide arc, the blade roaring to life. The crowd gasped, thinking it was part of the act. But when the blade sank into Ken's midsection, their shock turned to terror. Martha's scream echoed through the park as she clung to Ken, blood soaking her clothes. Devin's face twisted into a maniacal grin as he yanked the chainsaw free, the lifeless couple collapsing onto the stage, still holding each other. Panic spread like wildfire. People scrambled to escape, but Devin was relentless. With a speed and precision that belied his deranged state, Devin moved through the crowd, the chainsaw guitar roaring. Bodies fell in his wake, each death more gruesome than the last. One fan was decapitated, another impaled through the chest. Blood sprayed across the stage, the mosh pit transforming into a scene from a nightmare. Amid the chaos, the police arrived, but their efforts to stop Devin were futile. He seemed unstoppable, a whirlwind of death and destruction. Officers fired their weapons, but Devin dodged and weaved, his laughter echoing through the park. Desperation set in as fans realized there was no escape. Devin forced some to stab themselves, holding them at gunpoint. The park was filled with the sounds of screams, gunshots, and the relentless roar of the chainsaw guitar. The once jubilant concert had become a slaughterhouse. By the time the police managed to corner Devin, he had disappeared into the woods, leaving a trail of carnage behind him. Search teams scoured the area, but there was no sign of him. The only evidence of that horrific night was the gruesome footage captured by fans and the lifeless bodies strewn across the park. Cullingsville, Indiana, would never forget the night Devin Macabre brought death to their doorstep. The questions lingered, would Devin strike again? Was he lurking in the shadows, planning his next twisted performance? Or had he ended his own life, consumed by the madness he had unleashed? The mystery remained unsolved, leaving a scar on the town and chilling legacy that would haunt the punk rock world forever. Chapter 2 The Aftermath Cullingsville was in a state of shock. The small town, known for its quiet streets and friendly community, had been torn apart by the horror that unfolded at the concert. The local news was flooded with coverage of the massacre, showing the blood-soaked stage and the terrified faces of some survivors. The footage was so graphic that many networks refused to air it, but it quickly went viral online. Detective Sarah Jenkins had been on the force for over a decade, but she had never seen anything like this. The brutality and sheer chaos of the event left her and her team reeling. They combed through the park, gathering evidence, interviewing witnesses and trying to piece together what had happened. The survivors were traumatised, many unable to provide coherent statements. Devin Macabre's disappearance only added to the town's anxiety. Rumours spread like wildfire. Some believed he had fled the state, while others whispered that he was hiding in the nearby woods, waiting to strike again. 
the police set up checkpoints and increased patrols, but there was no sign of Devin. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Martha and Ken's families were devastated. They had come to Cullingsville to enjoy a night of music, never imagining it would end in such tragedy. Their funeral was a sombre affair, attended by hundreds who had been touched by their story. The town mourned with them, united in grief and fear. As the days turned into weeks, the town tried to return to some semblance of normalcy, but the shadow of the massacre loomed large. Detective Jenkins and her team continued their investigation, poring over every piece of evidence they could find. They discovered Devon's journal, filled with disturbing entries that hinted at his descent into madness. In his writings, Devon spoke of a voice that had been growing louder in his mind, urging him to kill. He described vivid nightmares where he was the harbinger of death, his music a siren song that led fans to their doom. The journal entries became increasingly erratic, filled with cryptic symbols and disturbing sketches of mutilated bodies. The police also uncovered a series of emails between Devin and an unknown correspondent. The messages were chilling, discussing plans for the concert and the final performance that would leave a lasting impact. The identity of the correspondent remained a mystery, adding another layer of intrigue to the case. Meanwhile, survivors of the massacre struggled to cope with their trauma. Support groups were formed, and therapists volunteered their time to help those affected. Many found solace in sharing their stories, but the memories of that night were haunting and inescapable. Devin Macabre's bandmates were in shock. They had known Devin as a passionate and talented musician, but they had never seen any signs of the darkness that consumed him. The band disbanded, unable to continue without their frontman and tainted by the horror of his actions. As the months passed, Detective Jenkins became obsessed with finding Devin. She spent countless hours reviewing footage, tracking down leads, and searching the woods where he was last seen. The case consumed her, and she became determined to bring closure to the town and justice for the victims. But Devin remained elusive, a ghost haunting the edges of Cullingsville. His legend grew, and the stories of that night took on a life of their own. Some claimed to have seen him in distant towns, performing under a new alias, while others believed he had taken his own life, his body hidden somewhere in the dense forest. The mystery of Devin Macabre persisted, a dark chapter in the town's history that refused to close, and as Detective Jenkins continued her relentless pursuit, she couldn't shake the feeling that the story was far from over. Chapter 3 Shadows in the Woods The dense woods surrounding Cullingsville had always been a place of mystery and local folklore, but after the massacre they became a symbol of fear and intrigue. Residents avoided the area, believing that Devin Macabre lurked somewhere in the shadows, planning his next gruesome act. Detective Sarah Jenkins had made it her mission to find Devin, driven by a sense of duty and a personal desire for justice. She spent countless hours combing through the forest, armed with a flashlight, a notebook, and a gun. The woods were vast and unforgiving, with tangled underbrush and towering trees that created an almost impenetrable canopy. One late evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, Jenkins and her partner, Officer Mike Rodriguez, ventured deeper into the forest than ever before. They followed a faint trail of footprints, hoping it would lead them to their elusive target. The air was thick with tension, and every snap of a twig made their hearts race. Stay close, Jenkins whispered, her voice barely audible above the rustling leaves. Rodriguez nodded, his grip tightening on his flashlight. They moved cautiously, scanning the area for any sign of movement. Suddenly they stumbled upon a makeshift campsite. The remnants of a fire pit, a torn sleeping bag, and a scattering of empty food cans suggested someone had been living there recently. Jenkins's pulse quickened. This was the closest they had come to finding Devon. Check the area, she instructed. Rodriguez began to search the perimeter while Jenkins examined the campsite more closely. Among the debris, she found a worn notebook, its pages filled with frantic scribbles and unsettling drawings. Her hands trembled as she recognized Devon's handwriting. Mike, over here she called out, her voice strained. Rodriguez joined her and together they pored over the notebook. The entries were a disturbing glimpse into Devon's fractured mind. 
He wrote of feeling pursued by demons, of hearing voices that told him to kill, and of a final act. That would eclipse the horror of the concert. As they continued to read, a chilling realisation dawned on Jenkins. Devon wasn't just hiding, he was planning something even more catastrophic. The notebook contained detailed notes on various locations, potential targets, and a timeline that suggested he was preparing for another massacre. We need to alert the others, Jenkins said urgently. He's planning something big. We can't let him slip away again. Before they could leave the campsite, a rustling sound behind them made them freeze. Jenkins and Rodriguez turned, flashlights cutting through the darkness. A figure emerged from the shadows, moving with a predatory grace. It was Devin. Well, well, Devin sneered, his eyes glinting with madness. Look who decided to join the party. Jenkins's hand went to her gun, but Devon was faster. He lunged at Rodriguez, knocking him to the ground. The two men struggled, but Devon's strength and insanity gave him the upper hand. Jenkins aimed her gun, but the chaos made it impossible to get a clear shot. Devin, stop, she shouted, but her words fell on deaf ears. With a swift motion, Devin overpowered Rodriguez, leaving him unconscious on the forest floor. Jenkins fired her gun, but Devin vanished into the trees, a ghost once more. Mike, are you okay? Jenkins knelt beside her partner, checking for signs of life. Rodriguez groaned, disoriented but alive. We need backup, she said, her voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through her veins. She radioed for help, knowing they couldn't face Devin alone. As they waited for reinforcements, Jenkins's resolve hardened. Devin Macabre had eluded them once again, but she was more determined than ever to stop him. The shadows in the woods held many secrets, but she was prepared to uncover them all, no matter the cost. Chapter 4 The Town on Edge News of Devin's latest sightings spread quickly through Cullingsville, heightening the town's already palpable fear. The police increased their presence, setting up roadblocks and conducting door-to-door -door searches, but the sense of unease persisted. Parents kept their children close, businesses closed early, and whispers of Devin's return filled every corner of the community. The local media kept the public informed with constant updates, but the details were scarce. The footage from the concert massacre continued to haunt everyone, serving as a grim reminder of the horrors Devin was capable of. Despite the police's efforts, many residents felt helpless, their once peaceful town now shrouded in terror, Detective Jenkins spent every waking moment working on the case. She reviewed the notebook they had found in the woods, hoping to find clues that would lead them to Devon. Each entry was a window into his twisted mind, filled with plans for chaos and destruction. The symbols and sketches hinted at locations around Cullingsville, but they were cryptic and difficult to decipher. Jenkins called for a meeting with her team to discuss their next steps, Officer Rodriguez, still recovering from his encounter with Devin, joined her, along with several other officers who had been working tirelessly on the case. We need to figure out where Devin is planning to strike next, Jenkins said, spreading a map of Cullingsville on the table. These entries in his notebook suggest he's targeting places that hold some significance to him. Like where one officer asked, leaning in to get a better look. Jenkins pointed to several locations marked on the map, these are all places he's mentioned in his journal, the old music store where he bought his first guitar, the abandoned warehouse where his band used to practice, and the high school where he performed his first gig. We'll need to stake out these locations, Rodriguez suggested, his voice still weak but determined. If Devin shows up, we'll be ready for him. The team divided into groups, each assigned to one of the potential targets, they coordinated with local authorities and set up surveillance, hoping to catch Devin before he could execute his next plan. The tension in the air was palpable, every officer on edge, knowing that at any moment, Devin could strike again. As the days passed, the town remained on high alert. The police presence was a constant reminder of the danger that lurked in the shadows. Residents rallied together, forming neighbourhood watch groups and supporting one another through the uncertainty. One evening, as the sun set over Cullingsville, Jenkins received a tip from an anonymous caller. The voice on the other end was shaky, barely above a whisper. I saw him, the caller said. 
Devin Macabre. He's at the old warehouse on the edge of town. Jenkins's heart raced. She relayed the information to her team and mobilized the units assigned to the warehouse. They approached the building cautiously, weapons drawn, ready for anything. Inside, the warehouse was dark and silent, the air thick with dust and the scent of decay. Jenkins led the way, her flashlight cutting through the darkness. They moved in formation, covering each other's backs as they searched the vast, empty space. Suddenly, a figure darted across their path, disappearing into the shadows. Their Jenkins shouted, and the team sprang into action. They pursued the figure through the maze of crates and debris, their footsteps echoing off the walls. Devin's laughter rang out, a chilling sound that sent shivers down their spines. He was toying with them, leading them deeper into the darkness. As they rounded a corner, Devin appeared, his chainsaw guitar in hand. The blade roared to life, and the officers braced themselves for the confrontation. It's over, Devin Jenkins called out, her voice firm. There's nowhere left to run. Devin's eyes gleamed with madness. This is just the beginning, he hissed. With a swift motion, he swung the chainsaw, and the warehouse erupted into chaos. The officers fought valiantly, but Devin was relentless. Jenkins and her team struggled to subdue him, the warehouse filled with the sounds of battle and the roar of the chainsaw. In the end, Devin managed to slip away once more, leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. As they regrouped, bruised and battered, Jenkins's determination only grew stronger. Devin Macabre had evaded them again, but she was more resolved than ever to bring him to justice. The hunt continued, and the town of Cullingsville braced itself for whatever horrors lay ahead. Chapter 5 The Network Detective Jenkins and her team were exhausted but undeterred. Devin Macabre had become their obsession, and every moment he remained free was another moment of danger for Cullingsville. After the confrontation at the warehouse, they realized they needed more than just brute force, they needed strategy and intelligence. Jenkins called a meeting with the town's officials and community leaders. They gathered in the town hall, a somber group united by a common enemy. The mayor, a portly man with a kind face, opened the meeting. We need to stop Devin before he strikes again, he said, his voice wavering. Detective Jenkins, what's our plan? Jenkins stood and addressed the room. We believe Devin is receiving help. Someone is feeding him information and supplies. We need to identify his network and cut off his resources. We'll start by interviewing everyone connected to Devin and his band, Slashers on Stage. The meeting lasted late into the night, with everyone contributing ideas and offering support. Jenkins assigned officers to various tasks, interviewing band members, monitoring known associates, and setting up hotlines for anonymous tips. Over the next few days, the team worked tirelessly. Jenkins and Rodriguez visited Devin's former bandmates, hoping to uncover any connections. They found Slim, the drummer, living in a rundown apartment on the outskirts of town. Slim was a wiry man with haunted eyes. He answered the door reluctantly, his expression guarded. What do you want, he asked, his voice rough from years of smoking. We need to talk about Devin Jenkins, said, showing her badge. Slim sighed and let them in. The apartment was cluttered with old band posters, empty beer cans and dirty laundry. I haven't seen Devin in months, he said, slumping onto the couch. Not since the band broke up. Did he mention any plans? Anyone he might turn to for help, Rodriguez asked. Slim shook his head. Devin was always a loner. But there was this guy, Eddie. They used to hang out a lot, talked about some pretty dark stuff. Last I heard, Eddie was living out by the old steel mill. Armed with this new lead, Jenkins and Rodriguez headed to the steel mill. The area was desolate, a forgotten relic of Cullingsville's industrial past, they found Eddie living in a makeshift camp among the ruins, a burly man with a wild beard and piercing blue eyes. Eddie was wary at first, but opened up after some persuasion. Devin's lost it, he said, shaking his head. I knew he was into some crazy stuff, but this, this is different. He's got this idea in his head, thinks he's some kind of dark messiah. Who's helping him Jenkins pressed. Eddie hesitated, then sighed. There's a network, all right, mostly online. 
They call themselves the Reapers they believe Devon's music has the power to change the world, but in a twisted way. They send him money, supplies, whatever he needs. Jenkins felt a chill run down her spine. How do we find them? Check the dark web, Eddie said. They're careful, but not invisible. You'll need a hacker, someone who knows their way around. Jenkins knew just the person an old friend from her academy days, now working in cybersecurity. She made the call, setting in motion a plan to infiltrate the Reaper's network and bring Devin's supporters to justice. Chapter 6 Digital Hunting Grounds Jenkins reached out to her friend, Alex Mercer, a cybersecurity expert with a knack for tracking down hidden online networks. They arranged to meet in a secure location, far from prying eyes. Alex was a tall, lean man with a serious demeanour and a wealth of knowledge about the dark corners of the internet. Thanks for coming, Alex Jenkins said as they settled into a private office at the precinct. We need your help to find and dismantle the Reapers. Alex nodded, his fingers already flying across his laptop's keyboard. I've heard of them. They're elusive, but not invincible. Give me a few hours and I'll see what I can dig up. As Alex worked, Jenkins and Rodriguez continued their investigation on the ground. They interviewed more of Devin's acquaintances, trying to piece together his movements and intentions. The picture that emerged was one of a man driven by a twisted ideology, convinced that his music and his acts of violence were part of some grand, dark destiny. Back at the precinct, Alex's search began to yield results. I've found several forums and chat rooms where the Reapers congregate, he said, his eyes focused on the screen. They use encrypted messaging and code words, but I can track their communications. What are they saying, Jenkins asked, leaning over his shoulder. Mostly praising Devin, sharing plans for future events, and discussing ways to evade law enforcement, Alex replied. There's a lot of chatter about the concert massacre. They see it as a triumph, a message to the world. Jenkins felt a surge of anger. Can you identify any of the key members? Alex nodded. I'm working on it. These people are careful, but they've made mistakes. I'm tracing their digital footprints, cross-referencing data. It's only a matter of time. As the hours passed, Alex's efforts began to pay off. He identified several key figures within the Reapers, individuals who were providing significant support to Devin. Jenkins coordinated with law enforcement agencies across the country to track these people down and bring them in for questioning. Meanwhile, the town of Cullingsville remained on edge. The increased police presence provided some reassurance, but the fear of another attack loomed large. Jenkins and her team knew they had to act quickly to prevent further bloodshed. One evening, as Jenkins reviewed the latest intelligence reports, her phone rang. It was Alex. I found something big, he said, his voice urgent. There's a plan in motion. Devin is preparing for another concert, but this one's different. It's going to be an online event, broadcast live to his followers. Jenkins's heart raced. When is it happening? Tomorrow night, Alex replied. They're using a secure server to stream the event. I've got the location. We need to move now if we're going to stop this. Jenkins immediately called for a team meeting. She outlined the plan, a coordinated raid on the streaming location to shut down the broadcast and apprehend Devin. They would also need to monitor online activity to track and arrest any key reapers involved in the operation. The team mobilised quickly, readying their equipment and preparing for the raid. Jenkins felt a mix of anticipation and dread. This was their best chance to stop Devin, but the stakes were higher than ever. Chapter 7 The Raid the next evening, under the cover of darkness, Jenkins and her team moved into position. The location Alex had traced was an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town, a fittingly grim setting for Devin's twisted plans. The area was cordoned off and tactical units prepared to move in. Jenkins briefed her team one last time. Our primary objective is to shut down the broadcast and apprehend Devin. Be prepared for anything. He's dangerous and unpredictable. As the clock ticked closer to the event's start time, the tension was palpable. Jenkins and Rodriguez led the team through the warehouse's darkened corridors, their flashlights cutting through the gloom. 
they could hear the distant hum of equipment and the murmur of voices. They reached the main room where Devon had set up his makeshift stage. Several reapers were busy with cameras and laptops, preparing for the live stream. Devin stood at the centre, his chainsaw guitar gleaming under the harsh lights. He looked up as the officers burst in, his eyes burning with a crazed intensity. Showtime he hissed, revving the chainsaw. Chaos erupted. The reapers scattered, some trying to fight back while others fled. Jenkins and her team moved swiftly, subduing the attackers and securing the equipment. Devin swung the chainsaw, narrowly missing Rodriguez, who tackled him to the ground. Devin struggled, his laughter echoing through the warehouse. You think you can stop me? This is only the beginning. Jenkins moved in, helping Rodriguez restrain him. It's over, Devin, she said, her voice steady. You're done. With Devin in custody, the team quickly dismantled the streaming setup, ensuring the broadcast never went live. The warehouse was secured, and the captured reapers were transported to the precinct for interrogation. As the dust settled, Jenkins allowed herself a moment of relief. They had stopped Devin's plan, but she knew the battle was far from over. The Reaper's network was still out there, and the threat they posed was real. Back at the precinct, Devin was placed in a secure cell. He continued to rant and rave, his mind lost to madness. Jenkins watched him through the bars, a mix of pity and anger in her eyes. Why, Devin, she asked quietly. Why did you do it? Devin looked at her, his expression twisted with a mixture of rage and glee. Because the world needs to see. To understand, only through chaos can we find truth. Jenkins shook her head, turning away. There was no reasoning with him, no understanding his twisted logic. All they could do now was ensure he never harmed anyone again. Chapter 8, Unraveling the Network with Devin behind bars, Jenkins and her team shifted their focus to dismantling the Reaper's network. Alex continued to track their online activities, identifying more key members, and with Devin behind bars, Jenkins and her team shifted their focus to dismantling the Reaper's network. Alex continued to track their online activities, identifying more key members and tracing their locations. The team knew that simply capturing Devin wasn't enough they had to cut off his support system to prevent any future plans from taking root. The first major breakthrough came when Alex managed to decrypt a series of communications between Reaper leaders. These messages detailed plans for recruiting new members, organizing events, and even funding Devin's activities. The information provided a roadmap to the inner workings of the Reapers. Jenkins coordinated with law enforcement agencies across multiple states, organizing simultaneous raids on several locations identified through the decrypted communications, these raids targeted safe houses, meeting spots, and the homes of known Reaper leaders. The operations were swift and decisive, leading to the capture of several high-ranking members and the seizure of critical evidence. Back at the precinct, the interrogation of the captured Reapers began. Jenkins and Rodriguez took the lead, using the evidence gathered to pressure the detainees into revealing more about their network. Some were defiant, clinging to their twisted beliefs, while others, facing the reality of their situation, began to talk. One detainee, a young woman named Lisa, who had been deeply involved in the group's online activities, provided valuable insights. Devin was our inspiration, she said, her voice trembling. We believed he could change the world, that his music and his actions had a higher purpose. What about the others Jenkins pressed? Who's in charge now that Devin is captured? Lisa hesitated, then sighed. There's a hierarchy. Devin was the face, but there are others who believe in the cause just as much. They'll keep trying, no matter what. Using the information from Lisa and other cooperative detainees, Jenkins and her team mapped out the remaining structure of the Reapers. They identified several key figures still at large and launched a series of targeted operations to bring them in. The process was painstaking and dangerous, but each successful raid brought them closer to dismantling the network. Chapter 9, The Final Showdown As the days turned into weeks, Jenkins felt the weight of the investigation taking its toll. The pressure to dismantle the Reapers and ensure the safety of Cullingsville was immense. 
and the town, while relieved by Devin's capture, remained anxious, knowing that the threat had not yet been fully eradicated. One evening, as Jenkins reviewed the latest reports, Alex called with urgent news. I found something he said, his voice tense. There's chatter about a final act, a coordinated attack to avenge Devin's capture. It's happening tonight. Jenkins's heart raced. Where? They're planning to hit multiple locations simultaneously, Alex explained. The old music store, the high school, and the abandoned factory. They want to create chaos, to show that they're still strong even without Devin. Jenkins mobilized her team immediately. They divided into three units, each assigned to one of the targets. The plan was to intercept the Reapers before they could carry out their attacks and to apprehend any remaining members. Jenkins and Rodriguez led the unit to the high school, a place filled with memories for many in the town. The building was dark and silent, an eerie calm before the storm. As they moved through the halls they heard the faint sound of movement. The Reapers were already inside, setting up explosives and preparing for their attack. Jenkins signalled her team to move in, catching the intruders by surprise. A fierce battle ensued, with both sides exchanging gunfire. Jenkins and Rodriguez fought side by side, their determination unwavering. In the midst of the chaos, Jenkins spotted the leader of the group, a man known only as Raven he was orchestrating the attack, barking orders and coordinating his followers. Jenkins knew that capturing him would deal a significant blow to the Reapers. She advanced towards him, her eyes locked on her target. It's over, Raven, she shouted. Surrender now. Raven turned, a sinister smile on his face. You think you can stop us? We're more than Devon. We're a movement. He raised his weapon, but Jenkins was faster. With a well-aimed shot, she disarmed him and tackled him to the ground. Rodriguez and the rest of the team secured the area, ensuring that all the intruders were apprehended and the explosives were defused. As Raven was led away in handcuffs, Jenkins felt a sense of relief. The final showdown had been intense, but they had prevailed. The Reapers were broken, their leaders captured, and their plans thwarted. Back at the precinct, Jenkins and her team celebrated their hard-earned victory. The town of Cullingsville could finally begin to heal, knowing that the nightmare was over. Jenkins knew there would still be challenges ahead, but for now, they had won a crucial battle. As she looked around at her team, she felt a deep sense of pride. They had faced unimaginable horrors and had emerged stronger. Together, they had protected their town and brought justice to those who had suffered. And though the shadow of Devin Macabre would always linger, Jenkins was determined to ensure that his legacy of terror would never rise again. Chapter 10. Rebuilding Trust With the capture of Raven and the dismantling of the Reaper's network, Cullingsville began the slow process of healing. The town, once gripped by fear, now faced the challenge of rebuilding trust and a sense of normalcy. Detective Jenkins and her team remained vigilant, knowing that the scars left by Devin Macabre's reign of terror would take time to heal. Community meetings were held to address the concerns of the residents. Jenkins attended these meetings, answering questions and providing updates on the ongoing efforts to ensure the town's safety. The support from local leaders and the resilience of the community played a crucial role in fostering a sense of unity. Jenkins and Rodriguez continued to work closely with Alex Mercer, using the captured data to track down any remaining Reapers who might pose a threat. Their efforts paid off as they identified and apprehended several more individuals who had managed to evade the initial sweeps. One evening, as Jenkins walked through the town square, she noticed the changes slowly taking place. Businesses were reopening, children played in the parks, and people were beginning to smile again. The weight of the recent horrors still lingered, but the town was moving forward. Jenkins was approached by Martha and Ken's families, who had been deeply affected by the concert massacre. Their pain was palpable, but they expressed their gratitude for her relentless pursuit of justice. You brought peace to our families, Martha's mother said, tears in her eyes. Thank you for everything you've done. Jenkins nodded, her own emotions threatening to overwhelm her. I'm just doing my job, she replied softly. But I'm glad we could bring some closure. 
Chapter 11 The Trial As the legal proceedings began, the captured reapers, including Devin Macabre, faced a series of trials. The courtroom was packed with journalists, survivors, and families of the victims, all seeking justice. The atmosphere was tense, the air heavy with anticipation. Devin's trial was the most high-profile, drawing national attention. His defence team tried to paint him as a troubled artist driven to madness by his inner demons, but the evidence was overwhelming. The footage from the concert, the journal entries, and the testimonies from survivors painted a clear picture of a man consumed by a desire for chaos and destruction. Jenkins and Rodriguez were called to testify, recounting their harrowing encounters with Devin and their efforts to bring him to justice. Their testimonies were powerful, underscoring the bravery and dedication required to stop him. The jury deliberated for several days before returning a guilty verdict on all counts. Devin Macabre was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The courtroom erupted in a mixture of relief and emotion as justice was served. The trials of the other reapers followed, with many receiving lengthy sentences for their roles in the violence and conspiracy. The legal victories were a significant step towards healing, providing a sense of closure for the victims and their families. Chapter 12 Reflections With the trials concluded, Jenkins took some time to reflect on the journey that had brought them to this point. The battle against Devon and the Reapers had been exhausting, pushing her and her team to their limits. But it had also forged a bond between them, a shared sense of purpose that would endure long after the case was closed. Rodriguez had become more than just a partner he was a friend and confidant, someone who had stood by her through the darkest moments. They often spent evenings discussing the case, their conversations evolving from professional debriefs to personal reflections. One night, as they sat on the porch of Jenkins's house, Rodriguez broke the silence. Do you ever think about what comes next, he asked, staring at the stars. Jenkins nodded. All the time. We've been so focused on stopping Devin that it's hard to imagine life without this constant threat. But I think it's time we start looking forward, rebuilding our lives just like the town is rebuilding. Rodriguez smiled. I couldn't agree more. We've been through a lot, but we made it. And I believe there's a brighter future ahead for all of us. Chapter 13 New Beginnings as the town of Cullingsville continued to heal, Jenkins and her team began to focus on new cases, applying the lessons they had learned from their battle against the Reapers. Their experiences had made them stronger, more resilient, and more connected to the community they served. Jenkins received a commendation for her leadership and bravery, an acknowledgement of her unwavering dedication to justice. While the recognition was appreciated, she remained humble, knowing that the true reward was the safety and well-being of her town. In the months that followed, the bonds between Jenkins, Rodriguez and Alex grew stronger. They formed a close-knit team, ready to face any challenges that came their way. The horrors of the past had tested them, but they had emerged with a renewed sense of purpose and a deeper commitment to protecting their community. As life in Cullingsville gradually returned to normal, Jenkins found solace in the small moments of everyday life a walk through the park, a conversation with a neighbour, a quiet evening spent reading. These moments, once taken for granted, now held a special significance. The legacy of Devin Macabre would never be forgotten, but it no longer cast a shadow over the town. Instead, it served as a reminder of the strength and resilience of the people of Cullingsville, and of the heroes who had stood up to confront the darkness. Chapter 14 A Quiet Resolve Months passed, and the town's sense of normalcy continued to grow. Jenkins and her team had returned to the daily grind of police work, handling the usual mix of cases that came their way. But there was a quiet resolve among them, a recognition of the battles they had fought and the lives they had saved. One day Jenkins received an unexpected visitor at the precinct. It was Lisa, the young woman who had been a key member of the Reapers and had provided valuable information during the investigation. She looked nervous, but determined. Detective Jenkins' Lisa began, her voice steady. I wanted to thank you. For giving me a chance to do the right thing. I know I can't undo the past, but I want to make amends. Jenkins regarded her thoughtfully. It's never too late to change, Lisa. The fact that you're here shows you're willing to take responsibility. 
What do you plan to do now? I've been volunteering at a local shelter, Lisa explained. Helping others has given me a sense of purpose. I want to use my skills to make a positive impact. Jenkins nodded, feeling a glimmer of hope. That's a good start. If you ever need support, we're here. Remember, redemption is a journey, not a destination. As Lisa left the precinct, Jenkins felt a sense of fulfillment. The journey they had all been on was far from over, but moments like these reminded her that even in the darkest times, there was always a possibility for change and growth. Chapter 15 Moving Forward Cullingsville continued to rebuild, its streets bustling with life once more. Jenkins found herself reflecting on the past year and the incredible journey she and her team had undertaken. The challenges had been immense, but the strength of the community had prevailed. Rodriguez had started mentoring young officers, sharing his experiences and helping them navigate the complexities of police work. His wisdom and compassion were invaluable, and his efforts were shaping the next generation of law enforcement. Alex, too, had found a renewed sense of purpose. He continued to work closely with the police, using his cybersecurity expertise to help prevent future threats. His collaboration with Jenkins and Rodriguez had evolved into a lasting partnership, one built on trust and mutual respect. Jenkins, now a respected figure in the community, took on a more active role in town affairs. She joined various committees and organisations, using her influence to advocate for mental health support, youth programmes and community safety initiatives. Her leadership extended beyond the precinct, making a positive impact on the lives of many. As the anniversary of the concert massacre approached, the town decided to hold a memorial service to honour the victims and celebrate the resilience of the community. The event was a chance to reflect, remember, and look forward to a brighter future. On the day of the memorial, the park where the massacre had taken place was transformed. Flowers adorned the stage and a plaque was unveiled, commemorating the lives lost and the bravery of those who had stood against the darkness. Jenkins stood among the crowd, feeling a deep sense of gratitude for the journey they had all shared. The town had faced unimaginable horrors, but they had emerged stronger, united by a shared resolve to protect and uplift one another. As the ceremony concluded, Jenkins took a moment to herself, walking to a quiet corner of the park. She closed her eyes, taking in the sounds of laughter and conversation, the warmth of the sun on her face. For the first time in a long while, she felt at peace. The past would always be a part of her, but it no longer defined her. She was ready to move forward, to embrace the future with hope and determination. And as the sun set over Cullingsville, Jenkins knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, she and her community would face them together, stronger and more resilient than ever before. Chapter 16 Unsettled Shadows Despite the sense of peace that had settled over Cullingsville, a lingering unease still haunted Jenkins. Though Devon Macabre was behind bars and the Reapers dismantled, she couldn't shake the feeling that there were still unanswered questions. The anniversary of the massacre had been a poignant reminder of the town's resilience, but also of the fragility of the peace they had fought so hard to achieve. One night, as Jenkins worked late in her office, she received an anonymous email. The subject line read you missed something her curiosity piqued. She opened the email. It contained a single line the Reapers were only the beginning. Attached was a video file. Jenkins clicked on the video, her eyes narrowing as she watched. The footage showed a masked figure in a dark room, speaking directly to the camera. The voice was distorted, making it impossible to identify the speaker. Devin Macabre was our prophet, but he was not the end. We are still here and our message will spread. This is only the beginning. Be prepared." Jenkins felt a chill run down her spine. She immediately forwarded the email to Alex, knowing he would be able to trace its origins. Moments later, she called Rodriguez and briefed him on the situation. "'We need to find out who sent this and what they have planned,' Jenkins said, her voice steady but urgent. Agreed, Rodriguez replied. "'Let's get Alex on it. If there's another threat, we need to be ready. Chapter 17. A New Threat Alex worked through the night, analysing the email and tracing its digital footprint. By morning he had some leads. The email had been routed through multiple servers to mask its origin, 
but he managed to narrow it down to a location on the outskirts of a neighboring city. This is where the email originated, Alex said, pointing to a map. It's an old warehouse, similar to the one Devin used. We should check it out. Jenkins and Rodriguez assembled a team and headed to the location. The warehouse was abandoned, its windows boarded up and the entrance locked. They forced their way inside, moving cautiously through the dimly lit space. As they explored, they found evidence that the warehouse had been used recently. There were signs of a makeshift camp, similar to the one Devin had set up, and several laptops and communication devices. This looks like a new hub, Rodriguez said, examining one of the laptops. They've been planning something here. Jenkins found a set of blueprints on a table, detailing several locations across the state. Each location was marked with a date and time, suggesting a series of coordinated attacks. We need to warn the authorities in these areas, Jenkins said. We can't let them catch us off guard. They gathered all the evidence they could find and returned to the precinct. Jenkins coordinated with law enforcement agencies across the state, sharing the information and organising a response. The realisation that the Reapers were still active and planning more attacks reignited the urgency and tension that had gripped Cullingsville months earlier. Chapter 18 Coordinated Response Jenkins and her team worked tirelessly, coordinating with various agencies to ensure that the locations marked on the blueprints were secured. They set up surveillance and increased patrols, hoping to catch the new members of the Reapers before they could execute their plans. The first location, a busy shopping mall, was targeted for an attack on a Saturday afternoon. Jenkins and Rodriguez were on site, overseeing the security measures. The mall was crowded, families enjoying their day out, unaware of the danger that lurked. As the marked time approached, Jenkins's team spotted several suspicious individuals entering the mall. They moved in quickly, apprehending the suspects and preventing what could have been a devastating attack. The suspects were taken into custody, and their interrogation revealed more about the new faction of the Reapers. They call themselves the New Dawn, one of the suspects confessed. They're determined to continue Devon's legacy. They believe chaos is the path to enlightenment. Jenkins felt a surge of determination. We won't let them succeed. Chapter 19 The Heart of the Movement the information gathered from the suspects led Jenkins and her team to the heart of the new Dawn's operations. It was a secluded compound deep in the woods, heavily guarded and fortified. The stakes were higher than ever, and the team knew this would be their most challenging operation yet. They planned the raid meticulously, ensuring they had all the necessary resources and backup. Jenkins coordinated with federal agencies, bringing in additional support for the mission. The goal was to dismantle the new dawn completely, capturing their leaders and preventing any future threats. As they approached the compound, the tension was palpable. The team moved in under the cover of darkness, using the element of surprise to their advantage. The compound was vast, with multiple buildings and watchtowers. Jenkins and Rodriguez led the assault, their focus unwavering. Gunfire erupted as they breached the perimeter, the new Dawn members fighting fiercely to protect their stronghold. Jenkins and her team advanced methodically, clearing each building and securing the area. The resistance was intense, but the training and determination of Jenkins's team prevailed. In the main building, they found the leaders of the new Dawn, huddled around a table covered in maps and plans. Jenkins and Rodriguez moved in, guns drawn. It's over, Jenkins declared. Surrender now. The leaders exchanged glances, their expressions defiant. This is just the beginning one of them spat. You can't stop the truth. Jenkins stepped forward, her gaze steely. We already have. Chapter 20 Victory and Vigilance With the capture of the New Dawn's leaders, Jenkins and her team had achieved a significant victory. The threat that had loomed over Cullingsville and beyond was finally neutralised. The compound was secured, and all remaining members were apprehended. Back at the precinct, Jenkins addressed her team. We did it, she said, pride evident in her voice. We've stopped another wave of terror, and we've made our community safer. But our work isn't over. We must remain vigilant and continue to protect our town. 
The team celebrated their hard-earned victory, but they knew the importance of staying alert. The scars left by Devon Macabre and the Reapers would take time to heal, but they were committed to rebuilding trust and ensuring the safety of their community. As Jenkins reflected on the journey, she felt a deep sense of fulfillment. The challenges had been immense, but they had emerged stronger, united by a shared resolve to confront darkness and protect the light. Hullingsville had faced unimaginable horrors, but it had also shown remarkable resilience and courage. Jenkins knew that as long as they stood together, they could overcome any challenge. And as the sun rose over the town, she felt a renewed sense of hope and determination, ready to face whatever the future held with unwavering resolve.